Welcome to the Youth Saving <laughs> Podcast. Last time we had Helena Lucas, and this time it's none other than Ben Cornish. Ben, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your background in the sport? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, thanks for having me on. Do a quick quick chat about, uh, I guess, where I am in sailing. And I'm currently on the phone to you from uh, sunny Palmer, um, down here with the the Ineos America's Cup Challenge in our uh, our testing season at the moment. So uh, things are busy and not much of a Christmas break, but we're uh, we're excited to get back into it. So where did you start sailing and how did you develop that? So I, I grew up in Exmouth down on the River X and I I got into sailing. Actually, my, my parents were members of the local sailing club and they uh, it was kind of a, a bit of a social place where I'd go and hang out, I guess, on a Friday evening. And I can't remember what it was called, but, you know, it was a, a sort of an introduction to sailing for young kids at the time. And that was really my first introduction. And in all honesty, I hated sailing to start with. I couldn't stand the sensation of being on the water. And probably the first two or three times, you know, I, I remember, I still vividly remember thinking I'm never going to do this again, you know, completely out of my comfort zone with it. And then I guess probably by the age of maybe 10 or 11, I, I really started to get into it. I don't, I don't know what changed that. Um, but the freedom, the sensation of, you know, being able to leave your parents on the beach and, and go and do your own thing, all of a sudden really gripped, you know, a bit of an addiction for me. Um, and yeah, from that point on, uh, I was really hooked. Yeah, sounds a bit like how I started back in Calshot in the winter, five day residential when I was about uh, nine, yeah. freezing cold with all the cruise ships going past. Yeah. <laughs> Helena said she didn't like sailing at the first point, did she? Yeah. yeah. Not many people enjoy sailing at first. And then when in the summer, it seems to be when people start to enjoy it properly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? If you can, I guess if you can fall in love with it in the UK through the winter, then nothing's really ever going to put you off it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it's not a bad time to, time to figure out you like it. Yeah. So at what point did you realise that you were quite good at the sport and wanted to do more racing, do more sailing? To be honest, it was, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a tough one. I I guess growing up in Exmouth, there were a lot of um, a lot of guys that were sort of on the Olympic journey, probably 10 years ahead of where I was in age-wise. So there was, I guess that was where I sort of started, started to understand, you know, what the sport is and what you can go on to do um and then there was a real strong community trying to get through like the cadet racing and just progress through through taking on you know like weekend events national events and and in all honesty i completely started from the very bottom you know i was absolutely awful had no concept of what racing was yeah. um no real background or understanding from from just growing up and doing it for fun didn't really understand the the fundamentals for quite a long time as as a kid and then um you know along with the help from some some real good guys in Exmouth volunteers and people whose kids had had moved on further up the line you know giving back to the younger guys and and putting them in the right direction for for getting better at racing and developing those basic skills um oh. but yeah i mean in terms of figuring out when it was actually, you know, something I was good at, it was probably not until I was 15 or 16 when I was, the, you know, the, the end of sailing junior classes, which for me was cadets. What boats are you sailing now? Um, so at the end of, I guess, the end of my dinghy sailing, let's say, um, I sailed the fin. So I, I went through a progression of, I initially sailed a, I think a laser Pico when I was my youngest. And then I went into the cadet class. Then the back of sailing cadets, um, is kind of a funny transition period where I'm sure you guys are experiencing it or will experience it where you've got a bit of a decision to make what pathway you go with, you know, double handed, single handed. And for me at the time, um, you know, it was something I, I wanted to focus on doing as much sailing as I could and, trying to find somebody with the same time time availability or you know in the local area that you can really do that with was difficult 
So that sort of led me to down the path of going single-handed into a laser, um, which was, again, a completely new start for me. Um, and then, you know, as the years progressed, the obvious transition from that was into the fin, which is where I guess my dinghy sailing came to a bit of an end a couple of years ago. On the America's Cup boat, what's your role on it at the moment? Yeah, so the last, I guess the last America's Cup um, in these AC-75s, uh, I was one of the grinders. Um, so the the engines on board, let's say. Um, yeah. And then this time round, uh, down here, we've got the 40-foot the test boat um, where we've, got, we've only got four crew. So you've got two helmsmen and two trimmers, you can call them. Yeah. Um, going forward for the next America's Cup, we'll have a crew of eight. You'll have within that eight you'll have four they could be grinders or they could be cyclors um so our engine room's got a bit smaller um and the overall crew's got a bit smaller as well is it true that your nickname is corn dog and who <laughs> came up with that it is that is true um i i couldn't tell you where it came from um yeah a bit of a development over the last the last few cycles here but yeah no that is my nickname <laughs> What's it like training and racing with Ben Ainsley? Yeah, it's cool. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, I guess, a real privilege because for me growing up, he was he was in his peak with the Olympic sailing. Um, so he was, I mean, when I was your guy's age, he was winning gold medals and he was on TV. And, you know, I was still learning the absolute basics of racing and looking up to that. And then you fast forward... 10 or 15 years now and um yeah it's very cool to be able to to share the same boat and you know be able to relive some of his experiences you know just from asking stupid questions or quizzing him when you're when you sat around it's cool if you could go anywhere in the world to sell where would it be oh that's a good question um i think lake guard is very unique i yeah. think yeah, that's probably the one there. place which, which stands out the most for me you know the first time I, I went there I remember thinking how surreal this is yeah um and every time I go back it's it's not much different yeah going up close and personal to the cliffs it just feels really crazy just seeing how big they are going right up close and then tacking next to them yeah I I mean throughout all of my sailing I generally hated sailing when it was light and tricky conditions so I was also a fan of knowing that Come one or two o'clock, it was going to be a, a decent breeze and and a good day out of racing. Yeah, we got quite unlucky when we went to Garda over the summer for the World Championships. It was quite odd. We had storms almost every night, and the wind died progressively through the day or through the week. Right by oh, the end, then, unlucky. yeah. And then one one night, it was blowing one direction really heavily, and then it stopped. Yeah. Twenty minutes later, it switched the other direction and started blowing again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a funny place. When it gets yeah. um, when it gets some of those storms, it, it can be it can be wild. I remember being there once and it sounded like there was a train or like a lorry outside the window. Yeah. And it was the just the front of this massive rainstorm blowing down the lake. But yeah. yeah, when it when it does blow there, it's it's incredible. As a junior, what was your best result that made you carry on? Uh, best result. I think yeah, it would have been probably I mean, I couldn't tell you when. It was a, probably as a cadet sailor. Um, myself and my crew at the time, Sam Matson, um, also from Exmouth, we finished, I think we finished in the top three a couple of times. And that was really the point where I started to think, oh, maybe I'll keep doing this and, and go on to, to try and do it properly. During your career, um, what's been your biggest event and how did you handle the pressures during that? Biggest event? <sighs> Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I guess the probably the highest pressure and the hardest racing I did was when I got to the fin. Um, and I, I through probably twenty sixteen and seventeen, I I started to get to the point where, you know, a bad result or a good result was somewhere in the top ten. And it, if I could put it together a good week, then I'd I'd be towards the front, and then. You're, with that your expectation starts to grow and grow um yeah in terms of the pressure it's a hard one um i never really 
got phased too much i guess the harder ones are when you're when you're midway through a big event and you're you know you start overthinking what could be for the last last half of it or um but you know the more the more events you do the the more of a process you build up to it kind of just becomes very natural you know that you're going to go racing for five or six days and you know that you know you can only do the right things at the right time what has been your biggest revival when in your sailing career biggest revival Ooh. uh well i guess there's one obvious one which was i was you know as a laser sailor i was part of what we had then was the the olympic development squad and i was with a group of sailors who are now at the top of the of the laser world um you know winning europeans winning world championships and for me I was all I was probably always on the back foot of that group. You know, if we'd have fast forwarded 10 years, I wouldn't have got to where they are now. Um, and I guess biggest revival was getting an offer to then trans to to transition into the fin class when um you know on the back of the 2012 cycle when Ben retired and then Giles became the number one fin sailor, that was a massive door open for me to then effectively go and become a bit of a sparring partner for at the time the best fin sailor in the world so then i had a a four or five year period where i was you know learning the trade off someone who was unbeatable and for me that was uh that was a huge opportunity who would be your favorite person to train with whether that's in the gym sailing cycling anything like that uh well i guess uh, you know me and giles spent five or six years you know spending 200 days together through that campaign so we spent I can't remember what the day count was but in the build-up to Rio I think you know he wanted to do something over a hundred certainly over a hundred days in Rio alone wow. so all of those periods we were we were living together training together gym together um, and then you know the same for same coming into the last bit of Tokyo I came back and and did a bit of saying there so yeah i guess he's the the person i've spent the most time with in that environment as you're uh part of like ineos have you ever cycled with the ineos uh cycling team yeah that's a good question just before um just before christmas actually we went up there with the with their entire team so 30 riders all of their wider team their coaches their staff um mechanics and we actually did a two week training camp with them um which was which was very cool you know having grown up a massive fan of cycling and watching all these these big names to then go and spend two weeks training with them and uh, riding alongside them was very cool but i can assure you that being 95 kilos riding alongside someone who's 60 in the mountains is a lot of hard work <laughs> before an event what is your favourite meal to have the night before? Favourite meal? Oh, well, if it, if we're gearing up for a for a windy event, you've got to be thinking something like a pizza or a pasta and loading up. Yeah, we, we've heard lots yeah. of things like that from Helena um, and yeah. stories <laughs> about different people. Ben Ainsley apparently likes a Chinese before a big event. Oh, I think pizza would probably be my, you know, a real, real good pizza. Yeah, car flow before the event. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So other than sailing, and do you play any other sports? Um, I, I guess the last few years I've played a lot of golf. And I have, well, I have really most of my life, but never never very consistently. Um, I follow football. I'm a massive Man United fan. Um, right. So I watched all of the World Cup, almost every single game I could. And... Outside of that, um, yeah, I, I will watch every sport if it's on TV. I'll happily follow any event. Yeah. So watching the Olympics is a dream for me because I'll get into anything. What do you like to do outside of sailing? Uh, well, cycling take is taking up a lot of my time. Um, even when it wasn't something we were looking towards for the America's Cup, it was always a, you know, it was where I would do most of my training. Um, now that's elevated a bit more so um 
yeah that takes up a lot but it's something you know around where I live back at home it's it's a really good place to do that and you can waste away quite a few good hours out on the road or on the mountain bike where's your favorite place to cycle Mallorca well I'm a bit biased now here in Mallorca but it's hard to hard to argue with uh with the thousands of people that come here every year to do it it's uh it's certainly got everything you know you can you can lose yourself in the mountains for the whole day or you can find yourself on quiet roads um with with virtually no traffic so yeah it's it's pretty amazing here and the weather's so consistent um you don't have to wrap up quite as warm as you do back at home and make sure you're not going to get wet every day have you ever met lewis hamilton because you're part of the ineos and they're also <laughs> by ineos no i've i've never formally met lewis but uh the the setup that we have with the mercedes team back at back in the uk at brackley is uh the formula one simulators in the basically in the room next door to where we operated um so we've crossed paths quite a few times in in the canteen getting a coffee while he's been in between sessions. Do you have any other plans for the future apart from America's Cup? Uh you know, it's tricky really when you're when you're in the I guess in the madness of the America's Cup. It it really does it takes up every day of the week. Um and you get so you absorb yourself so hard into it there's not really a huge amount of time to think further than further what this challenge is but um yeah you know i'd love to stay involved in sailing in some way um hopefully young enough to have a few more a few more attempts at the america's cup going forward so you know once you once you do break into this world of let's call it very different sailing because it's it's not as you know it conventional a lot more technology and um how else can I describe it? You know, it's just, I guess, not as much sailing, but you are, you're talking sailing every single day or you're talking about development design. I guess for me, that's probably the pathway I hope to keep going with. What does it uh, feel like when you're flying up the water in the AC-75? Yeah, it's a strange sensation, actually. It's, um, you know, it's so smooth on the foils you don't really get a huge amount of reference for how fast it is. Yeah. Um, so last time each sailor on board has a display in front of them so they can see the, you know, the critical info on the boat. And one of the readouts for everyone is the boat speed. And you'd look down in, I don't know, let's say 15 knots of wind and you'd be going downwind at 40 odd knots. But the boat is so smooth and level that of course, when you maneuver, you get a feel for the G force and how fast you're going. But, it's really not until you stop or you hit the water or you, you know, you crash down off the foils that you really appreciate how fast the boat's traveling. The hard, I guess, the hardest days are when if you're in one of the support ribs or the chase boats and you're trying to keep up with the yacht, Yeah. you know, for a, for a rib to do 40 or 45 knots, it's, you know, it's pretty uncomfortable. Do you think the next Maris Cup is the year that Great Britain will actually beat the Kiwis for once? <laughs> well i i obviously have to say yes um you know i hope i hope that is the case we've got a we've got an enormous team and we've got some serious manpower behind us with with mercedes and um you know trying trying to win the thing is is of course as they say a design race um you know if you can turn up in barcelona next october with with the fastest boat in the fleet then you give yourself a pretty good chance. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed that that could be the case. So we saw before the actual America's or Prada Cup started, your NES Team UK were a bit far behind. The races didn't go too well. How did you guys kind of get through that and end up one of the fastest boats? Yeah, um, that's a good question. It's, you know, you're, the thing is you're you're developing until the very end so yeah you know it's even mapped out now you could look at the calendar now and you could say you know you push everything as late as you can because you want to give the designers every single day they can have before you make decisions so you're always effectively going to run out of time at the end there's no way of of, of coming around that 
but even when when you're racing it's very different to to i guess dinghy or olympic class racing you're even you're pushing through developments day to day after racing so you come in and people are they will analyze the performance and they'll say all right we, we see an issue here or maybe we can try this for tomorrow and there's so much work going on in the background that it's you know it to the i guess to the public eye watching it's very hard to keep up with you know they were they were no good yesterday but oh they've made a big step forward yeah. um and you know a lot of that is it comes out of the data that the that the boat is just constantly measuring across all the teams um and yeah we effectively we made some some reasonably large changes like you say in between those two series um I guess part of the part of the benefit as well was the the conditions, um, the very bottom end of the light of the light winds were were difficult for our for our boat, and then the second phase of that event was a bit windier. The boat almost fell into its sweet spot, yeah. Which is another you know it's a huge thing you have to consider for the America's Cup is you can't just design a boat that's going to be good for everything because you'll be beaten by someone who's who's got it more specific, um. So it's a tricky one, you know. A lot of a lot of consideration has to go into where do we want this boat to be strong in in which conditions. You were in the race when American Magic came off their foils and had a crack uh, crack inside of the hull, weren't you? And what was it like when uh, that yeah. happened? Um, yeah, just well, I'm trying to think back, but um, you know, at the time, it was a, it was a windy day and. Um, you know shifty and squally with with the rain clouds that day um but um i guess the in the build up to the to the event people had been out training a lot and a few of the boats had capsized or had big crashes so it, although it was you know it was obviously fairly dramatic um i guess that was enhanced a bit by the fact that it was caught in such detail with you know the helicopter shots and all of this but um yeah, I guess the real the real event was the the following couple of hours when they they were really trying to keep the boat afloat. Um, the capsize itself, you know, thankfully everyone was was unhurt. Um, but I guess the main story there was, you know, what what a job it was for the for all the teams to, you know, come together and and try and keep that boat alive. And I I think it's still probably not given enough credit how much of a job it was. You know, they effectively had to rebuild the inside of that boat. Um, and if you put your head inside an AC-75, it's it's a bit like looking in what I imagine a spaceship would look like. You know, just wiring, electricals, hydraulics. And for the, for somebody to, you know, to say, right, team, we've got to pull all of this out because it's fried and we've got to start again. You need to be ready in five days or whatever it was. That was, that was phenomenal. Thank you, Ben, for letting us getting to know better and all about your journey through the sailing is there anything else you would like to add no worries not at all uh, no just uh i guess the main message needs to be enjoy the sailing and you know if you if you're craving to get out in the water every day then it's a good sign that you'll uh, you'll stick with it <laughs>